So please join me in welcoming Frank Brogan to the stage. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, first of all, the invitation to join you all today, and uh, uh, for the very warm welcome. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, my job here is simple. I've been given what now is nine and a half minutes to cover school safety. Um, how tough can that be? Uh, I guess they were out of issues like, what is truth? Uh, and you've got five minutes. Um, no, I, I really do want to just give you some high level information more than anything and then turn it over to uh, a panel of wonderful people who will give you lots more important information and par perhaps uh, titillate uh, the imagination as to what the responsibilities and the opportunities are. Um, during my career, uh, I started as a fifth grade teacher and then uh, went into administration as a dean and ultimately an assistant principal and a middle school principal. Uh, I remember like it was yesterday, it was 1985, and I was an assistant principal, and I was in my office uh, before first period on a middle school with 1,500 students. And as you might know, being uh, attached with education, it's a very busy place that time of morning. And I was actually in meeting with a parent and a student who was going through some difficulty, and a teacher ran into my office, uh, clearly out of breath, and uh, almost yelled, uh, Mr. Brogan, you gotta come quickly uh, to the back of campus. Named a student and said, some people think he may have a gun and he's out of control. So without thinking, I was much younger and crazier in those days. I literally ran from my office, ran to the back of campus, and as I got within hailing distance, the amount of uh, frenetic activity was picking up People were obviously visibly excited and, and anxious. And when I did get to the back of campus that opened up to a series of ball fields, and this was Florida and it was uh, May and it was very hot, I could see ahead of me uh, a boy that I recognized as the boy who had been named with two other students. All three I knew and all three were seventh graders and the two were very, agitated and excited and yelling for the boy to please stop. And they were his friends. Uh, I closed the gap between myself and where they were by hurrying whenever the boy would turn around and begin to walk away again. Still couldn't determine if he actually was armed or not because of the position of his body. Uh, and when I finally and literally got within almost arm's length, called him by name, he uh, promptly turned around. Uh, I was now looking into a set of eyes that should belong to no human being. He was that out of control. And he dropped between my eyes a fully loaded 357 Magnum and proudly pronounced that if I came one step closer, he was gonna blow my brains out. Uh, I folks thought my number was up. Uh, I b still believe to this day the only thing that saved me in this particular case was the fact that this had been a troubled young man and he and I in my role as assistant principal have worked together on many occasions, uh, all in a very good way uh, with good outcomes. And I literally think even in his state, he could see me and see the relationship we had and I think perhaps that's what saved me. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, I ultimately was able, as he turned away and started to lower his skinny arms with his finger still blue on the trigger uh, to signal to the other students to move away and get out of harm's way and they ultimately did move around a little hill that was there. Uh, I then decided the best thing to do was get him off his feet and uh, counseled him to the fact that I was shaking violently and my knees were giving out and we were both perspiring and that I was going to sit down when he joined me. He said, no, I will not sit down. And I took a chance and said, well, I'm going to and sat down on the same hill. Uh, he ultimately wandered over and sat down next to me, still with the gun to the outside and his finger, which I never took my eyes off of, blew on the trigger. 
And so I started to talk to him about the problems he was facing and the fact that his father had beaten him yet again and the fact that he could take it no more, uh, went into the liquor cabinet and some of the prescription drug bottles and came uh, with his father's fully loaded 357 Magnum that he had purloined from the top of the closet to do he not, didn't know what when he got there. He just knew school was the place something had to happen. By virtue of that fact, I started to talk to him and I really believe was coming close to getting him to turn the gun over to me when the SWAT team came around the other side of the hill. He panicked, uh, started to come up into the crouch and bring the gun this way in the classic shooting position, just I think more than anything as a reaction to being shocked. Um, I dove over top of him, still have no idea why, it seemed the thing to do, push the gun down as it discharged at our feet instead of straight ahead, and then managed to get my hand pried between his and the gun, pulled it away, threw it on the hill so that the SWAT team could see it was no longer in play. Um, they wrestled him onto the ground and he spent about a year and a half in a psychiatric facility for young people. Uh, I don't tell you that for uh, anything other than the issues we're dealing with, even the cosmic issues, are not new on school campuses. What I do hope and pray by being in the Department of Education, which is now working very hard on this issue with states, with uh, districts, and with individual schools, is trying to finally keep the discussion and even the debates ongoing and not allow them to fall back off the radar screen until the next and the next and the next. And I actually am optimistic that this issue, prompted by not just one, but several of the most recent shootings, has spawned almost a we've got to do something mentality, which is a bit different than it has been in the past, where people get taken up with issues that are also important and take their eye off this one, where the news media that does everything in 72-hour news cycles doesn't stop urging people on to be able to tackle this. And as I'm blessed to do, work for the federal commission that was formed on school safety, start to do more listening to principals and teachers, to law enforcement officers, and to moms and dads and others on this powerful, powerful and critical issue. I was always told when I was hired as a school principal or when I became commissioner of education for the state of Florida or when I became lieutenant governor that first and foremost in all those official capacities my job was to make certain people were safe. It was my duty, it was my responsibility. Even when I was that teacher who had been called upon to run to the back of campus into Lord knows what I was going to find, it was second nature. That was my job, was keeping people safe, first and foremost. But how we do those things should not just be subject of what we think our responsibility is, or is it someone else's responsibility. First, we are all responsible for our own personal safety, and second of all, we need to organize around students at every level. This is not just about pre-K through 12. This is about uh, early intervention programs for students who are babies. This is also about colleges and universities. Wherever students and teachers are gathered, safety needs to be first and foremost on the lips, minds, and hearts of everybody, every day, not just in the wake of a tragedy. So as we work with the commission members who represent four federal commission offices and agencies here in Washington, including the Department of Education. Here's the key. We can't mandate school safety. That's easy, but impossible to implement. This isn't going to happen through statute, through fiat, through just signaling that this is something we have to do, do it. This is about everyone working together to find complex solutions to an incredibly complex set of problems. There is no one way to do this. 
If there were, wouldn't it be wonderful to think if we just found it, identified it, and said implement it, we would never have a tragedy again on a school campus. We all are realists. We know that's not going to happen. And therefore, we have to not only keep this issue on the radar screen, we have to talk. We have to set aside political agendas while we talk and make the safety of people on school campuses the priority issue. We have to avoid the political correctness of certain topics and recognize everything, everything has got to be on the table if we're ultimately together going to find solutions to this complex problem. ECS has been around for a long, long time. And as we talked at the table beforehand, the idea that groups like ECS need to be an important player in this regard. This issue doesn't belong exclusively to anyone or any one enterprise. This belongs to America as an issue. And therefore, we need to listen to America and work with America to make certain that indeed we can every day make this issue as important as it has got to be. So on behalf of not only the Department of Education, but I think I'm safe in saying today, on behalf of the four federal agencies in the White House who continue to make this an important issue, and that is not a political statement, people are very sincere about this, continue to help provide feedback and information into at least this one element, as you do in local communities and in districts and in school site work, to make sure this stays on the top of the agenda and that we never take it off the top of the agenda. But thank you to ECS for the invitation. Thank you all for coming together. I know this is your last day of the gathering, so I'm surprised to see as many of you here as I do. Good for you. And thanks on my personal behalf. Maybe someday some assistant principal won't get called out of his or her office early in the morning to have to face an experience like that. Maybe someday some little boy won't come to school in a situation like that. Maybe someday when boys and girls go to every campus in America, the last thing they're going to have to think about and worry about is their own personal safety. So thanks again for the work that you do. Thanks again to ECS. Thank you again for your comments and for coming and sharing them with us. I'd now like to ask for our, the uh, panelists to please come up on stage as I introduce you. We're really excited to have panelists who um, will come on up and I'll introduce you as you're coming up. So um, we're really excited to have this group of panelists because we bring not only a state perspective from K-12, but also a perspective on higher ed and a national perspective. Jennifer McCormick is Indiana's Superintendent of Public Instruction and is a nationally recognized innovator in education and has made school safety and preparedness one of her key priorities. Kevin Kruger has more than 35 years experience in higher education and as the president and CEO of NASPA, he is constantly leading the discussion on how higher ed students have a voice around safety and concerns. And Ken Trump, no relation to the president or the administration, um, four years ago, Ken actually spoke at one of our national forums and we introduced him as Mr. Trump. He said he'd go as Ken now, just to make sure it's a little easier. Ken is one of our nation's leading school safety experts. He has more than 30 years of frontline experience working with schools and safety officials in all 50 states. Four years ago, he was on a similar panel like this with then Department of Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano. So please join me in welcoming our panelists to the stage. So Jennifer, let's start with you and talk a little bit about your perspective on this issue from K-12 and what you're seeing at the state level. So I want to start out by, I know we have teachers of the year in this room and other educators and I want to thank you because I know your jobs are complex, they're difficult and they're rewarding. So enjoy this moment, but I also know too the role that you play in school safety every day. So it, it was, as mentioned earlier, 365 days 
a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And even since I've been at this conference, unfortunately, I've called two superintendents about two students who've been murdered in a short amount of time. And so it is critical that it stays on, on the forefront regardless of crisis. You know, unfortunately, we watch the news like all of you and we're well aware of what was happening across the nation. And then in the end of May, it happened in Indianapolis. And so we had a school shooting at the end of the school year at a middle school, uh, very young students. We had a teacher who was shot multiple times and a student who was shot multiple times, both survived. But you talk about bringing that to your backyard. We had a shooting in 2011, but circumstances were a little bit differently. But regardless, it is a very pressing issue. In Indiana, we're having a lot of discussion about resources, readiness, and relationships. We know we have to have all three. We know we have to pay attention to the community landscape, the state landscape, and the national landscape. So we're having really hard conversations. I think it's critical in our states to be honest to not take anything off the table. You know, why are we spending $40 million a year in testing when we're spending $10 million a year in safety? You know, those are the conversations that we need to have. We need to look for solutions. We need to look for resources. We have a school safety academy in Indiana that has trained over 2,300 school safety specialists, thanks to people like Mr. Trump, Ken, um, that has been present through that. It started in 1999, but it's critical, and it really does train each district to be better prepared if a crisis does happen. So we're very well aware of what's happening, but I think it's an honest conversation, really taking a look at those three areas. That relational piece, everyone in this room knows, critical with the social emotional learning piece and just making sure those connections between partners and law enforcement there's just so many layers to it that i think those honest conversations have to happen that's great kevin talk a little bit about higher ed and some of the issues around safety sure. i know we have partnered with your organization a little bit to put out some publications on guns on campus and on sexual violence on campus yeah. but give us your perspective well let me start with uh that we kind of classify these as health, safety, wellness issues. And so obviously some of this emphasis of today's conversation is about um, active shooters and things of that nature. Um, we, we would broaden it because the health, safety, and wellness issues for adolescents, in particular rising adolescents in a college setting, are pretty, pretty broad. Obviously, issues around gun safety is certainly one of them. But I would also add that many of you are aware of the attention we've paid in college and universities around sexual violence. Um, even issues around protests and activism, which is on one hand a First Amendment issue, on the other hand involves bringing external folks to the campus and the safety issues that are embedded in there. Just look at University of Washington as an example um, where there was a death around a protest. Um, suicide, which is uh, still the second leading cause of death among college students. Um, uh, issues for alcohol and other drugs is another sort of safety issue for us. Um, and then lastly, in the news often right recently is uh, issues around hazing. Um, in both fraternities and sororities as well as other entities on campus. My point being that the safety issues are pretty broad um, and really dominate a lot of the work that, um, that takes place on campuses. I represent uh, what, what's called the student affairs part of a campus, which is the folks who manage the out-of-class part, the non-curricular part of the campus. Um, and I would say that you know, these, these issues and, uh, are uh, often the top three, four, five issues that are on a college president's agenda, um, as an example. i just say two things that we can dig into this a little bit more. Now, Ken will talk about this. But as we think about how we manage this on a college campus, um, we're always thinking about two things. One is, and, and Jeremy, you mentioned this, one is prevention. And how do we um, sort of instill an educational um, effort on campus so that we can change the culture on campus around some of these safety issues, the ones that are in our control? Um, and then secondly, how do we